Because the other thing I, I found confusing listening to it this morning was why he didn't know the street names when there are only three street names in that particular area. Uh, he knows that area. Why would he feign total lack of knowledge when there's just three street names? Well, I think that's very telling because the biggest, the biggest, um, I think, piece of evidence against George Zimmerman is his own words to the not, to the non-emergency officer, where he said that Trayvon, he goes, "Oh, s, he's running," and he gets out of his car. The off, the dispatch asks him, "Are you following him?" He said, "Yes," and he said, "We don't need you to do that." He says, "Okay." Well, he told Singleton, um, Detective Singleton, and Detective Serino that he got out of his car to look for an address. That's very inconsistent, and that's very self-serving. And I think that goes to who confronted, who was the aggressor. Having said all this, and final question, uh, Natalie, and briefly, if you may, having said all this, the problem you have, surely, as the prosecutors here, is that the key witness, the one person that can really, really answer these questions, is dead, and that's Trayvon. Under Florida law, if you were just listening to those police testimonies today, you would say that the law of probability now is that they will probably succeed in defending George Zimmerman under the way Florida law works, unless some new evidence comes to light. I would refer you back to Rachel Gentile, who said she was on the phone when she heard it. She said she heard George Zimmerman approach Trayvon, and she said she heard Trayvon say, get off. I, I believe that's why the prosecution put her on. And if you question her inconsistencies, which only, she had a few inconsistencies wording, so did George Zimmerman, so did John Good, so did all of these witnesses. This is a year and a half later. So I think the jury will take all of this into consideration.